chapter 14 entitled Pregnancy of Ditti in the Evening. And today's text is number seven. Please repeat Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Devanam, by the demigods. 
Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Tam Asking Asking Translation by His Divine Grace A.C. Bhakti Vedanta Swami Prabhupada So what's happening is Vidura just heard from Maitreya about how Lord Varaha appeared that the Lord appeared in the form of a gigantic boar. And Vidura, with great interest, heard about how this boar incarnation lifted the earth out of the Garbodak Ocean and killed a demon named Haranyaksha. So now Vidura has asked, why did Varaha Dev have a fight with Haranyaksha. What's the history of this enmity between them? So Maitreya thanked Vidura for his question and is beginning to narrate the history behind how Haranyaksha came to be killed, how he, how he even came into existence, Haranyaksha, how he took birth, and how he came to ultimately be killed by Varaha Dev. So in today's text, Maitreya says, this history of the fight between the Lord as a boar and the demon Haranyaksha was heard by me in a year long ago. As it was described by the foremost of the demigods, Brahma, when he was questioned by the other demigods. So Maitreya is making it clear to Vidura that I'm not just making up a story. This is not just an old wives' tale. This is an ancient narration. And I heard it long ago when Brahma spoke this narration to the demigods when they, like you, made inquiry. So all of our stories here in the Bhagavad Purana are backed by historical context and spoken by spiritual authorities. They're not, you know, some of them are just walking right now off the street into our Bhagavatam class. They would probably not give us a whole lot of, you know, serious thought if they heard us reading stories about a big boar mm -hmm. that killed some guy in the ocean. You know, it doesn't sound like, you know, what mushrooms did you eat when you wrote that, you know? So it's, it's like we have to, like Maitreya, when we speak, we have to back our speaking up with Shastra, scripture, and by citing authorities. So this verse does not have a purport. And I'm not going to continue with further verses. The next verses actually now begin the narration of how did he gave birth to Haranyaksha. Mm -hmm. But what I would like to do is, today is Mokshada Ekadashi. Uh -huh. It's the advent of Krishna's speaking the Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna. Mm -hmm. So generally on this day, the Vaishnavas like to recite the entire Bhagavad Gita. But that takes hours. So, unfortunately, this year at New Taliban, that's not going to be happening. It hasn't been organized, but in any case, um, because today's verse just fortuitously happened to mention uh, about uh, hearing from a long time ago, Maitreya is an interesting character. We don't have such a history, at least I wasn't able to find such a history on him. Prabhupada mentions that He's a sage of the days of yore, and that he actually met Vyasadeva and had religious discussions with him. But we're hearing in today's verse that he heard Lord Brahma speaking narrations of Varahadev to the other demigods. So Maitreya has been around for a really, really long time. So then he created that Lord Brahma? Well, yeah. So, is he, I don't think he's one of the Manasas Putras, though. He's not one of the seven great sages, you know, Manasaputras, the, the sons from Lord Brahma's mind. I'm not exactly sure. 
what its history is. But in any case, I thought, therefore, we could go into Bhagavad Gita, since it is the advent of Bhagavad Gita today, that we could look at a section in the Bhagavad Gita where Krishna also describes the ancient age of Bhagavad Gita. Uh, in chapter 3 of Bhagavad Gita, Krishna concluded the chapter by answering a very prudent question that Arjuna had. Because after Krishna spent some time, you know, instructing Arjuna that one should not give in to personal motives and personal desires and personal attachments and personal opinions on how things should be done, rather one should with single-pointed attention do what the Supreme Lord wants them to do. So I understand Arjuna, I actually understand. I understand where you're coming from. You don't want to kill family members, of course, right? That breaks your heart. You've even, you even quoted some Dharma Shastras that said thou shalt not make, you know, kill family members and make women husbandless and fatherless and sonless. You know, you did all that. However, I'm here to instruct you that the highest Dharma is just to do what the Supreme Lord asks you to do even if it tends to go totally against what you normally think would be the right thing to do. So then Arjuna, at the end of chapter 3, expresses a doubt to Krishna, and he explains to Krishna, yeah, but I don't know if I can do that, because there's this power that seems to overcome me even though I know what the right thing is to do, there's, there's this like power that overcomes me and causes me to do that which I should not do. So what is that? And Krishna says, oh, that is lust only, Arjuna, born of the mode of passion. And he tells Arjuna that one can, or one should, overcome this lust uh, by knowing, so knowledge, transcendental knowledge, one can overcome lust by knowing oneself to be transcendental to the material senses, mind, and intelligence, and not just knowledge alone. So first one has to have knowledge of their transcendental nature, then one has to do the very hard work of steadying the mind. It's the mind which causes us to identify, right? Because the mind gets attached to the sense objects and the thoughts that go through the mind and the speculations that the intelligence has. So Krishna says, in addition to transcendental knowledge, one has to do the hard work of steadying the mind by deliberate spiritual intelligence or Krishna consciousness. And in this way, with spiritual strength, you can conquer the insatiable en enemy known as lust. Now, Arjuna might be doubting Krishna. That, well, this is what you say I should do. Have all this transcendental knowledge, steady my mind, have, you know, uh, deliberate spiritual intelligence. So Krishna, perceiving that doubt, uh, gives the history of Bhagavad Gita. Now I'm not just making this up on the spot. You know, here we are on the battlefield, right? We're in Kurukshetra on the battlefield. And the pause button has been pushed. We haven't started the war yet because you're on a mental trip having all these doubts. So everybody's just waiting. And I'm not just going to make this up right on the spot, right? So he tells Arjuna that what I am telling you, he says, Imam Vivaspate Yogam Kokavan Aham Abhyam Vivaspan Manave Praha Manur Ekshakave Pradeep. This is the beginning of chapter four. That Arjuna, I instructed this imperishable science of yoga to the sun god Vivaspan. And Vivaspan instructed it to Manu the father of mankind. And Manu, in turn, 
and instructed it to Ishmahu, which Manu are you speaking about? There's 14 Manus in a day of Brahma. 14 Manus in a day of Brahma. And Krishna is saying that the sun god spoke this to Manu. So which Manu? No, the previous one. No? By Vashvata Manu. And the clue here is that in this Manvantar period, the sun god is called Vivasvan. In each Manvantar period, there's a different sun god. So how far back is that? So Vivasvan is the sun god currently, and his son is Vaivashvata Manu. There's 14 Manus in the day of Brahma. We are currently in the seventh of those 14. And in that 14th Manvantar period, we're just 28 out of 100. 28, 28% through uh, this month period. So we're at about 11.30 a.m. in Brahma's day. <laughs> so Krishna tells Arjuna that, you know what? I spoke this long ago to the sun god Vidhisvan. He passed it on to his son, Vaivashvata Manu. Vaivashvata Manu handed it off to his son, Ikshvahu, who's the father of mankind. Well, Manu is the father of mankind. Manu in turn instructed it to Ikshvaku. So I thought we could read a few verses here where Krishna is giving the history, and I'll read Srila Prabhupada's purports. So please try to hear. This will be in place of reciting the entire Bhagavad Gita today. So Srila Prabhupada's purport. Herein we find the history of the Bhagavad Gita, traced from a remote time, when it was delivered to the royal order of all planets, beginning from the sun planet. The king of all planets, the kings of all planets, are especially meant for the protection of the inhabitants. And therefore, the royal order should understand the science of Bhagavad Gita in order to be able to rule the citizens and protect them from material bondage to lust. Here we see the connection between Arjuna's question about lust and how to overcome it and Krishna's all of a sudden giving a history lesson. Why is Krishna giving a history lesson after Arjuna inquires about lust? Prabhupada explains it here. That the reason uh, Krishna's telling Arjuna the history of the Bhagavad Gita is because this Bhagavad Gita is meant for all the kings on all the planets. Why? Because the duty of the kings is to protect the citizens. Protect them from what? From alien invasion? <laughs> from disease? From poverty? Sure, those things are there. But what they're really supposed to protect the citizens from is bondage by lust, bondage to lust. The real purpose of leadership, whether you're a king or a president or a governor or a, you know, Rashad Dave says, don't even become a leader. Get off your high horse, buddy, you know? Don't be a father, don't be, you know, don't be a parent, right? Don't be a husband, mm -hmm. don't be a guru. Don't be a demigod. <coughs> Don't be a political leader. Don't be a teacher. Stop it. Don't take positions unless you are able to deliver your dependence from the cycle of birth and death. How do you deliver your dependence from the cycle of birth and death? By teaching them how to become free from the bondage to lust. So the leaders are supposed to protect the citizens in this way. That's why Krishna's giving the history of Bhagavad Gita. Prabhupada continues, human life is meant for cultivation of spiritual knowledge in eternal relationship with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And the executive heads of all states and all planets are obliged 
wives. What does that mean? You have to do it. It's mandatory. You're obliged means you've done something for me, now I'm obliged to do something for you. So all the heads of all the planets and all the states have been given their positions ultimately by the Supreme Lord. Here, we're going to give you a position. And you get all the benefits of that position, right? Isn't it whoever's, the, you know, the head honcho, they always get like the best living quarters and the best cars, vehicles, and the best treasury and the best everything. Okay, we've given you all this. Now you're obliged to impart this lettuce lesson to the citizens. You don't do your job, then get out of office. Why are you sitting in the chair of the king, the throne, or the office of the king, or the president, or what prime minister, or whatever it is? Why are you sitting there if you're not doing your job? Do your job or get out. So they're, uh, the leaders are obliged to impart this lesson to the citizens. How? How are they going to impart the lessons to the citizens? Uh, Prabhupada, yeah. huh? Uh, the yes, but Prabhupada says the lessons will be imparted in three ways. So please hear these three ways, because Prabhupada is actually quite expert at trying to do this <laughs> in this kind. Whether we're doing it or not is another story, but... The three ways that the leaders impart this transcendental knowledge to the citizens is one, by education, two, by culture, and three, by devotion. Many people like to just read the books. You know, you're an initiated devotees. I just, you know, I just read the books. I, I understand Krishna consciousness. I can write a 55-page essay <laughs> on, on philosophy. I can give a three-hour class. But are we practicing the culture? And are we devotional? Devotion means that whatever my service is, whether it's raking the leaves, trimming the trees, washing the floor, washing the pots, cooking, worshiping the deity, whatever that service is, that I put my devotion into every detail. Every single detail. I am fully aware of what I'm doing. Fully conscious of what I'm doing. I'm punctual. I'm clean. I'm neat. I'm organized. I don't shortcut. I don't cut corners. I don't space out while I'm doing it. By education, culture, and devotion. So that's Brahminical culture, Prabhupada's talking about. Vaishnava culture. In other words, the executive heads of all states are intended to spread the science of Krishna consciousness. How many heads of state on planet Earth are doing this? Can you name one? Name one. <laughs> so, but that's that they're intended to spread the science of Krishna consciousness. Otherwise, get out of office. So that the people may take advantage of this great science and pursue a successful path, utilizing the opportunity of the human form of life. Hmm. What is that opportunity of the human form of life? Yeah, so those who have pet animals, you recognize that there's not a whole lot of difference between that animal and me. You look into their eyes, and they have emotions. They have the need, the need or the desire for love and affection and reciprocation. They eat, I eat. They sleep, I sleep. Right? They mate and defend, I mate and defend. But there's something intrinsically different between me and my pet that I so much love. And that is the opportunity of human life to take advantage 
of a higher path called Krishna consciousness, to be liberated from the cycle of birth and death. And if one's not taking seriously to that unique and rare opportunity of human life, then one is said to be committing suicide. Atmaha, or killer of the self. And Parikshit Maharaj, with some kind, with some level of surprise, uh, in the tenth canto, says to Shukadeva Goswami, Parikshit expresses to Shukadeva Goswami the amazing glories, the amazing benefits, the amazing opportunity we have to hear Bhagavat Kata or Srimad Bhagavatam, discussions about Lord Krishna. And then he says to Shukadeva with great wonder, who in the world, uh, you know, after knowing all the glories and benefits of hearing Srimad Bhagavatam, who in their right mind would not want to sit and hear Srimad Bhagavatam? Mm -hmm. And he answers his own question by saying, only one who is a slaughterer of animals or a killer of his own soul, Atmaha. One who commits, who is committing spiritual suicide. So leaders are to encourage their citizens to take, utilize the opportunity of the human form of life. Otherwise, those leaders are therefore simultaneously guilty of killing their citizens for all intents and purposes. Prabhupada continues, in this millennium, the sun god is known as Vivasvan, the king of the sun, which is the origin of all planets within the solar system. In the Brahma Samhita 552, it is stated, Lord Brahma says, Let me worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Govinda, who is the original person, and under whose order the sun, which is the king of all planets, is assuming immense power and heat. The sun represents the eye of the Lord and traverses its orbit in obedience to his order. Prabhupada continues, the sun is the king of the planets and the sun god, at present of the name Vigasvan, rules the sun planet which is controlling all other planets by supplying heat and light. He is rotating under the order of Krishna. And Lord Krishna originally made Vivisvan his first disciple to understand the science of Bhagavad Gita. The Gita is not therefore a speculative treatise for the insignificant mundane scholar, but is a standard book of knowledge coming down from time and memorial. And now Prabhupada's going to give a little mathematical calculation of how old it, it, it appears to us that the Bhagavad Gita is. When you go to the university and you take any kind of course that might mention the history of the Bhagavad Gita, they'll say, you know, 1000 BC. That's like 3000 years ago. They'll say Bhagavad Gita is 3,000 years old. If they're really, really generous, they'll say 5,000, but they don't usually do that. So listen to these numbers. In the Mahabharata, we can trace out the history of the Gita as follows. In the beginning of the millennium known as Treta Yuga, this, now we talked about the Yugas the other day, last week maybe, and at this current time, it goes Satya, Treta, Dwarpara, and Kali. So we're in the Kali Yuga. So this is two Yugas ago. In the beginning of the millennium of Treta Yuga, the science of the relationship with the Supreme was delivered by Vivasvan to Manu. Manu, being the father of mankind, gave it to his son Maharaj Ishvaku, the king of this earth planet and forefather of the Raghu dynasty, in which Lord Ramachandra appeared. Therefore, Bhagavad Gita existed in human society from the time 
of Maharaj Ishvaku. At the present moment, we have just passed through 5,000 years of the Kali Yuga, which lasts 432,000 years. Before this was Dwarpara Yuga, 800,000 years. And before that was Treta Yuga, 1.2 million years. Thus, some 2 million years ago, not 1,000, not 3,000, not 5,000. Some 2 million years ago, Manu spoke the Bhagavad Gita to his disciple and son, Maharaj Vishvaku, the king of this planet Earth. The age of the current Manu is calculated to last some 305,300,000 years, of which 120,400,000 have passed. Accepting that before the birth of Manu, the Gita was spoken by the Lord to his disciple, the sun god Vivisvan, a rough estimate is that the Gita was spoken at least 120,400,000 years ago. Okay, but then if you go to school and they tell you about the Gita is 3,000 years old, you can say, huh? <laughs> I heard it was 120,400,000. And in human society, it has been extant for 2 million years. So in the universe, almost, you know, 120.4 million years. But on this earth, 2 million. That's still nothing to, you know, what they would compare with the scholars say. It was re-spoken by the Lord, again to Arjuna, about 5,000 years ago. That is the rough estimate of the history of the Gita, according to the Gita itself, and according to the version of the speaker, Lord Sri Krishna. It was spoken to the Son of God, Vivisvan, because he is also a Chatriya, and is the father of all Chatriyas who are descendants of the Sun God, or the Surya Vamsha Chatriyas. Because Bhagavad Gita is as good as the Vedas, being spoken by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, this knowledge is aparusheya, superhuman. It means it has none of the defects of human authorship. You or I, any of us may be very, very intelligent, very, very knowledgeable, and we may, may be very erudite scholars and fantastic authors, but our writing will always be marred to some degree by the four defects that we have. They'll be limited because we have four defects, and those four defects of the living entity that humans display, we have imperfect senses. Uh, we make mistakes. Cheap. We make mistakes. Can you believe it? I know some of us don't want to admit it, but we actually make mistakes. I make every day. Oh, I hope so. Mm -hmm. Then you're normal. <laughs> and uh, we tend to be in illusion. And despite having those three horrible flaws, you know, how horrible, how embarrassing. I mean, you look in the mirror and you've got like, blemishes on your face, you gotta put some makeup on it to cover it up. Like you're embarrassed that you've got like these ugly things on your face, you don't want to show anybody. And, I mean, you close your mouth, but you don't want people to see that you're missing two teeth. Mm. Smile, look, smile, look, you look close. Mm. Right? We're so embarrassed. But why aren't we embarrassed? Why aren't you embarrassed? You're walking around full of these faults of imperfect senses, to, tendency to be illusion, making mistakes, and despite having those three embarrassing faults, we cheat. Well, how does that mean? Prabhupada says the cheater has become the teacher, right? We're teaching and speaking like we're knowledgeable. We're writing books. We're giving lectures. My opinion is. And, but the whole time, that's called cheating because you're not free of the defects. So what good is your opinion? What good is your so-called writing and speaking? So Prabhupada says about the Bhagavad Gita that this Bhagavad Gita is not like that. It is aparusheya, or superhuman. <laughs> Since the Vedic constructions are accepted as they are without human interpretation, the Gita must therefore be accepted without mundane interpretation. Bhagavad Gita 
as it is, not as, you know, Ani Buddha wants to comment on it, right? It's Bhagavad Gita as it is. The mundane wranglers may speculate on the Gita in their own ways, but that is not Bhagavad Gita as it is. Therefore, Bhagavad Gita has to be accepted as it is from the Pacific succession. And it is described herein that the Lord spoke to the sun god, the sun god spoke to his son Manu, and Manu spoke to his son Ishvakuri. Well, I won't read any more purpose. I'll just read a few verses here to conclude our little history of the Bhagavad Gita on this advent of Bhagavad Gita day. Text two, very, very important. Verse eight. This supreme science was thus received through a chain of disciplic succession. And the saintly kings understood it in that way. That's how they understood it. By just what they heard in disciplic succession. They didn't have to go do research become big, big scholars and go do research. They just humbly accepted what they heard in Pacific succession. But in due course of time, the succession was broken. How are you going to hear from the Pacific succession if the, if the succession is broken? Therefore, the science as it is appears to be lost. Oh, no. The examples <clears throat> given of a river, a river is flowing, and at a certain point it disappears. Where'd it go? Sometimes they go underground, and they're flowing underground, but you don't see it because you're on the earth up here, you're not seeing it. Really, there's a river flowing under my feet? So the river's going nicely, and then at a certain point it enters like a cave or something, whatever. And it goes underground. And it flows for so many miles or whatever underground. And at another point, it comes out again. So to us, it appears to be lost, right? Oh, the river ended. It hasn't. But your ability to access it, your vision of it, you're separated from it. But then it pops up again downstream somewhere. So similarly, the Bhagavad Gita, the science of Bhagavad Gita is never lost. But the succession coming down may have a break to our vision. Certainly, Bhagavad Gita was never meant. Oh, where was I? Text number three. Sa eva hamaya tedya yoga prapta paratana bhakto sime saka cheti rahasyam gita uttamam. Now, Krishna gives the formula about how you, how we, can be recipients of that Bhagavad Gita. Wouldn't that be nice to be a recipient of Bhagavad Gita? It's not by going, to, going and buying the book and reading it. Here's how you become a recipient of the science of Bhagavad Gita. That very ancient science of the relationship with the Supreme is today told by me to you because you are my devotee as well as my friend. And can therefore understand the transcendental mystery of this science. We're not just meant to, meant to be official devotees, you know, like Bhai Bhakta, Bhaktas, just follow the rules and regulations and, you know, whatever, be in awe and reverence. We're meant to be the friend of Krishna. <clears throat> I'll stop there, but that's text number three, chapter four. And if anyone has time today, uh, we did three out of 700 verses. There's about 600 